Hello, today we'll discuss the diagnosis of COPD. So what, the first thing we'll do, as we discussed in, an, in another video, is to look at the symptoms. Symptoms, the cardinal three symptoms that we need to remember is dyspnea, so difficulty breathing, chronic cough, and sputum production. This has been dealt in another video, please check that out. Next thing we do, we ask, do we need a lab? No. No lab test is important for uh, diagnosing COPD. No lab test. Forget laboratory, okay? We need something else. We need spirometry. Spirometry is, called, is written like this. Spirometry. That's the most important thing. What, what this spirometry will, we will take a tube and we will measure the flow of air that the patient can inhale and exhale. Why did I say that we don't need the lab? Because the lab is only there for you to exclude other causes of dyspnea, so other causes of, of difficulty breathing. We cannot really check COPD by lab values. But spirometry, here what we need to re refresh is some, is some lung function. So here's a tidal volume. This is usually around 0.5 liter of air that you in inhale, so inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, like this. That's normal. And when I, when I ask the patient to inhale drastically, like this, then exhale drastically, and then breathe normally, I have caused then him to inhale three liters more of air, and then exit, <sighs> until he cannot exhale anymore. And that is also another around 1.5 liter extra. So it means we have 0 0.5 liter like that, 3 liter of 1.5. If we take that plus that plus that, it will be 5. So around 5 liters of air is, uh, is something that you can breathe in and breathe out. And that is called the vital capacity. The vital capacity is from here to there. Tidal volume from here to there. The inspiratory is here to here. So inspiratory capacity is here, three liters, expiratory capacity from here to there, 1.5. So, and here, here we have something called residual volume from here to there. That is when I ask you to exhale totally, <coughs> you think that you don't have any uh, air anymore in your lungs, but you have. You have another extra, almost 1.5, around 1.3 extra residual volume after exhaling. Why is this important? Why is this all important? Because in spirometry, we will ask, first of all, the patient to inhale drastically and exhale drastically. And this is called forced vital capacity. Forced vital capacity. That is the amount of uh, air that you, can in, uh, that you can exhale after inhaling maximally. This amount. But then I will ask him also to do it in more quickly and I will, measure it in, I will measure it in one second. That is called forced expiratory volume in one second, in one second. That means he will maybe not reach 100%, so he cannot exhale totally because I ask him to do it in one second. And as you know, if you want to exhale, it will not, it, you will not make it in one second. So for example, if I do it like this, <sighs> you see, it takes some time. It takes two, three seconds. So it means that we will reach a level here, for example, in one second, then what I will do, I will divide. So I will divide the forced expiratory volume divided by forced vital capacity. And if I get a value that is less than 0 0.7, so if this is 70% of that, it means I exhaled it here only 70%, from the 100% here, because th these, this last part, I could only exhale in the second or the third second. It means that if I have less than 0 0.7, then I know that we have an airflow limitation, airflow obstruction, and then we need to continue our diagnosis. Because this can be due to asthma, it can be due to COPD, it can be due to hyperinflation, it can be due to air trapping, many, many causes. How do I know it's due to asthma or not? So we, we did this spirometry, we saw this le less than 0 0.7. Then I will give the patient some bronchodilator. I will dilate the, bro the bronchioles, so the airways, and then the patient can breathe much better. 
but only in asthma. So then we call it reversible or irreversible. Why? Asthma is reversible. That means that if you give this bronchodilator, and what type of bronchodilator do we give? We give something called albuterol, albuterol, 400 microgram of albuterol is given, and then the patient can breathe be better after that in asthma. But in COPD, it's not. That's irreversible. It's permanent. It's persistent. Whatever, whatever word, you, word you use, it means just that the airflow limitation is still 0.7%. So 70%. It, it, it did not get better. For example, in asthma, if it was less than 70%, maybe after this albuterol, he will reach here, 80%. But in COPD not. Then you have distinguished D2 types. Because as we saw in another video, the COP COPD and asthma is very, very common together also. They are overlapping. And they are very similar in, in symptoms. So you need to distinguish this. What do we do next? Now we have done the spirometry. We saw it was less than 0.7. We saw that it, it did not get better after giving albuterol, so after giving a bronchodilator. Then we know it's COPD. Now that we know that it's COPD, then we need to go on to check which type of gold standard. So you, call, you write it like this. Gold stands for Global Initiative of Obstructive Lung Disease. And we have three numbers that you need to remember 80 50 and 30 everything above 80 is then gold standard number one between 50 and 80 is two between 30 and 50 is three and everything less than 30 is gold number four how do how do i reach these values what, what does this mean 80 50 and 30 it's 80 50 30 percent percent of what percent of force expiratory volume in one second. This value that the patient gets in one second, the force expiratory volume in one second, compared to the population. Because the population, in the, you can download it from the internet, there is a table that you can find here. In this axis you have age, in this axis you have height, and then you say that, yeah, I have a 65-year-old patient and he is, I don't know, 180 centimeter long. Then he is this guy. And this value is, for example, 2. I don't know, 3. That means 2.3 liters of volume of air in one second in the population. That's normal for this height and for this age in the population. And I compare that to the real value of the patient. To, 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 to make math a bit simpler, let's say this value is 2 here. And I want, uh, and the patient got 50%, so he only got 1. He got 1. So then I take 1 instead of 2, that's 50%. So I know it's it's around 50%. It's around stay gold standard 2 or 3, yeah, depending on which side you choose. Okay? That's, that's how you make it. So that's the force expiratory volume in one second. Something else that you can do after spirometry is, is called body plethysmography. So body plethysmography. Long word body plethysmography and this is something that you can uh, do to check the lung volumes all the lung volumes not just this forced expiratory volume and in that way you can decide if the patient has something called hyperinflation so hyper inflation or he has something called air trapping air trapping What's the difference between these? The only difference is that in air trapping, we have a total lung capacity being normal. And in hyperinflation, we have an increased total lung capacity. That's the main difference in this. And uh, total lung capacity means this thing that we draw, the tidal volume, the inspiratory capacity, the expiratory capacity, plus 
the residual volume. Residual volume is the distance here, so the distance between total ex expiration and then there still exists some air in the lungs. And that's the residual volume. And if you take, add up all this, this residual volume is around 1.3. And we know that the vital capacity here is around 5 liters. So the total capacity of the lung is around 6.3. 6.3 that's the total amount and if this value is the same in air trapping and in hyperinflation it's increases so for example total lung capacity will become i don't know 6.5 6.6 .6, then, then we can differentiate between these two things but i will not go into the details of this i just want to show you how m many things you can do with spirometry and then with body platysmography the, the thing that we have in both of these is that we have an increased residual volume. Now, a functional residual volume. The functional residual volume is the residual volume plus the expiration, expiration part, so this one. And in both cases, we will have increased amount of that. And in both cases, we will have decreased functional, so decreased forced vital capacity. Actually, when we do when we do spirometry, when we do spirometry, the thing that we see is that the force vital capacity is decreased, and then we do the body platysmography. So the indication for doing this is to have a patient who has symptoms and a patient who has decreased force vital capacity. Then you are allowed to do body platysmography. You should not do it any uh, otherwise. I mean, it's ridiculous. You you should not do diagnostic things that are not useful but it's useful for patients who have symptoms and a decreased force vital capacity and the only difference between these two hyperinflation and air trapping is the total lung capacity is the same in air trapping and in hyperinflation it's increased okay good so i said that we will not do any lab test but there exists one thing that we can do and that's called alpha one antitrypsin antitrypsin deficiency we will only do this after we have made spirometry so spiro i will write like write like this spiro after spiro and after seeing that we have a permanent airflow obstruction which means we have copd because we said we have a reversible then it's asthma or we have an irreversible so permanent then we have copd if we see that it's not asthma if you see that it's COPD by permanent airflow, then we do alpha antitrypsin uh, deficiency test. And this is a genetic disease that you inherit from your parents and cause you to get COPD much easier. And this can be seen in young patients, for example. But because as we said in other videos, smoking is the most common cause of COPD. 80% of COPD patients smoke. But there exist also patients who did not smoke who are young, have never been smoking, and they get COPD. And then they ask themselves, what is happening? Yeah, this is happening. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So please check this if you see in the spirometry that you have an airflow obstruction, which is a permanent one, and you don't have any um, smoking in your... Actually, you, you should check that by patients who are smoking also. So the criteria that you should use is to have an permanent airflow obstruction plus symptoms of COPD. That's it. Then you, then you do an alpha-1 antitrypsin. That's the only lab test that can diagnose something related to COPD. The other thing we can do is arterial blood gas. So arterial blood gas. Arterial blood gas. This is something that we will puncture the artery, we will take some uh, blood from it, and we will then look at the pH, we will look at how many percent of uh, oxygen we have in the blood, and when do we, where, what is the indication? We will not puncture every patient. Only the patients who are acutely exacerbated, so acute exacerbation, that means we have, we have a known COPD and he has an exacerbation of symptoms. We have a lot of symptoms quickly. This happens in a regular time for COPD patients. That's an indication. The other indication is that we have less than 
oxygen with a pulse oximeter. That is, that is something you put on your finger and then you measure this, the oxygen level in your blood by, by uh, only putting a device on your finger. And if it's less than 92%, then you check that also. Or if you see that he is depressed and not like depression, depressed consciousness. So he is very, very tired and he's uh, sl slowly answering your questions. So any type of these signs or very severe symptoms. So then you take a blood arterial blood gas. This is the only lab. This is the second only lab test that you will do. So I wanted you to I wanted you to know that there exist two tests that we can do at least laboratory to not diagnose COPD, but this will then show you what type of level of uh, oxygen you have in your blood. And if you have less than 92%, then please give some oxygen to the patient here th through the nose. And you can give, for example, two liters of oxygen. But after giving oxygen, what happens is that you, when you give too much oxygen to the patient, after, for example, 30 minutes or one hour, we will get something called hypercapnia hypercapnia and that is when we have an increased amount of CO2, so carbon dioxide. So CO2, that's carbon dioxide, hypercapnia. So after 30 minutes, after giving this oxygen, please check that. So these are the things uh, that you need to watch out. So when you give oxygen, please check it every 30, one, uh, 30 minutes, one hour. Check the, if the level is around. The, in a COPD patient, actually, you can be you can be satisfied with having an uh, oxygen level of around 88, okay? Don't panic, don't panic. In a normal person with 88, that's really terrible. That, that's, that's, that's really bad. But in a COPD patient with 88, that's acceptable. Anyway, please, to, please try to get this value around 88 and not higher. Why? Because of the danger of get, getting too, too much of carbon dioxide. Because if you try to over, over treat it with oxygen, then this will increase. So carbon dioxide always increases when you give too much oxygen. And, and this can cause coma. So it, the, the patient can be totally, totally co comatic patient. Okay, that's very, very dangerous. So please watch out. So I think that's enough. So just to conclude in one sentence, diagnosis of COPD, please use spirometry. That's it. Check the uh, forced expiratory uh, volume in one second. Divide that with the forced vital capacity. If you get a level of less than 0.7, then go on and then uh, classi uh, classify them into reversible or irreversible. If it's reversible, then it's asthma. If it's irreversible, then it's COPD. Then you can go on with the body plethysmography to check if the patient is having a hyperinflation or an air trapping. And if you want to classify the patient into which uh, severity of the COPD, then you take the gold classification and you have four types here. Everything about 80% is gold one, 80 to 50, gold two, 50 to 30, gold three, and less than 30, gold four. And I think that that's enough to know. Thank you very much for listening.